Welcome, everyone. Um, it's time to convene our uh, spring 2011 uh, CNI member meeting. Uh, there are a number of seats over here if anybody in the back is looking for seats. Let me welcome you all to San Diego. Um, it has been a pretty long and nasty winter on some parts of the East Coast, at least. And I hope that some of you who have come from there are enjoying a um, early preview of uh, spring here and um, no snow. Uh, I know many of you have traveled long distances to be here, and we appreciate your efforts. I want to extend a particular welcome to our international um, attendees. Uh, I know that getting places internationally seems to just get a little more complicated every year, and we're very glad that you could join us. While I am making welcomes, I also want to extend a special welcome to some of um, Chris Borgman's um, graduate students from UCLA who have uh, made a special trip down here to um, uh, be with us while um, uh, Chris uh, receives her award. And uh, I'm delighted that you were able to join us. CNI's founding director was Paul Evan Peters. Um, some of you knew him. Uh, many of you, I fear, um, particularly as time goes on, um, did not have the opportunity of um, getting to know him. Um, he uh, died suddenly in 1996. And CNI did a couple of things working with other colleagues, with his family, with partner organizations, to, um, uh, to honor his achievements and his memory. Um, one thing that we did was the uh, Paul Evan Peters Scholarship, um, which, uh, underwrites, which helps to underwrite a um, graduate student in the uh, information sciences every year. The other thing we did was the Paul Evan Peters Award. This is presented jointly by CNI and its sponsor organizations, the Association of Research Libraries and Educause. And the award, and you can find um, some information on it in this little blue um, folder, which uh, we put in everybody's um, registration packet, um, the, the award really wanted to recognize Paul's um, intellectual passions to honor the sustained commitment, uh, the, the sustained achievements of people who had made creative and lasting achievements that really led to change in the way we did teaching, learning, scholarship, the way we operated as a society. Um, Paul, of course, was interested not just in higher education, but he was deeply um, concerned with the broader social implications of technology and um, uh, how society would be changed as technology evolved. And I think that um, the, um, the award winner that we're going to honor and hear from today is a particularly um, fine choice in um, recognizing that passion of Paul Evan Peters. We had a nominating committee which, um, which uh, it, which um, uh, took care of the award this year, and uh, while only um, Joan Lippincott um, is here with us from that committee, I do want to recognize the hard work and contributions of the committee members, Marjorie Blumenthal from 
Georgetown, Nancy Eaton um, of Penn State University, now retired, and uh, Bill Hogue of the uh, University of Southern Carolina. Um, they, I know, um, wrestled with a number of outstanding candidates. Um, this is, when, when, when you think about the, um, the list of recipients of this award, Dan Atkins, Paul Ginsberg, Brewster Kale, Vince Cerf, and Tim Berners-Lee, um, that's, a, that, that, that's, that's a list that gets um, more challenging with every uh, cycle. And um, I think that uh, the committee has met the challenge wonderfully. The Paul Evan Peters Award um, for 2011 uh, goes to Christine Borgman. She is the professor and presidential chair in information studies at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Um, she is a long-standing colleague of mine. Uh, we've um, we've tracked each other's work, I think, for more years than I'm going to talk about. Going back through um, trying to understand what um, large-scale online catalogs meant as sort of. Um, uh, one of the first public access information systems at scale um, back um, uh, when Melville was being deployed at the University of California um, uh, through organizations like the American Society for Information Science and Technology. Um, Chris has done a lot of things, um, and I'm not going to try and summarize them all but I just want to touch on a couple of them. Um, she has been deeply concerned with science policy and about policy issues in technology and society for many, many years, um, uh, going back to um, uh, the uh, early days of things like the um, uh, computers and privacy uh, conferences. Um, so she has, you know, really sort of founder credibility in that world, um, uh, which, you know, not a lot of people have. Um, she's actually done uh, a good deal of system building over the years um, as part of teams that have worked on a number of scholarly information systems. In recent years, she's been deeply engaged with the Center for Embedded um, Network Sensing at UCLA, which um, conducts a um, really fascinating portfolio of work um, uh, ranging from, you know, sort of very technical stuff around the deployment of, um, of sensor networks all the way through the kind of policy issues about how you describe and manage and share the streams that come out of these networks. She's had a long-standing interest in the interactions between teaching and learning on one side and technology on the other. And um, a number of you probably remember her wonderful talk a couple of years ago here reporting on the work of the um, Task Force on um, Cyber Infrastructure and Cyber Learning that um, she was asked to chair by the National Science Foundation. That report on cyber learning still stands as probably the most substantial um, look at what this panoply of infrastructure technologies actually could mean to teaching and learning as opposed to higher end um, uh, research and you know the training of advanced graduate students. Um, and uh, I think has been quite influential, although um, uh, we can still hope, I think, to see a, um, a, a real funded program at scale following on from that work. Uh, I could go on at considerable length about other things she's done, but I just want to mention 
her work as an author, and specifically these last two books that she's done, um, From Gutenberg to the Global Information Infrastructure, and more recently, Scholarship in the Digital Age. Um, these are both wonderful sort of synthesizing books that really look very, very broadly at um, uh, a series of complex evolutionary developments that sit between the social and the technical with a dollop of economics and policy and other um, seasoning in there as well. Um, but between them, I think they, um, they make a tremendous contribution in um, outlining and illuminating the evolution of scholarship and scholarly communication as altered by technology in recent decades. Um, I'm consistently struck as I look at them, these um, two books, at the kind of resonance back and forth between the interests and agenda of the coalition over the last 20 years and the developments which she documents, analyzes, and illuminates in these works. So um, I'm particularly delighted to see um, uh, this award go um, to in part recognize a body of, of synthesizing work that, as I say, sits on the boundary between the technical and the social, um, uh, and that is so consistent with the interests and, um, uh, and passions of, of Paul Evan Peters on one side and the trajectory of the coalition on the other. Please join me in welcoming and honoring Chris Borgman as she delivers her Paul Evan Peters lecture, Information Infrastructure and the Internet, Reflections on Three Decades in Internet Time. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Clifford, for that, that beautiful introduction. It is indeed a great honor, not only for the award, uh, but the, the great honor and pleasure of being able to give it here in front of my many longtime friends, colleagues, current students, and, and current collaborators as well. May I have the slides, please? It is um, indeed a, a rare chance to, to get to talk to this audience, and uh, Clifford suggested that I use this time uh, as an opportunity to reflect on the field and on prognosticate where we might go from here, and Clifford has always been one who's given me very good advice for uh, several decades now, and, uh, and I took that as an opportunity, and I've been working on this for, for some months, and in the process, it became, I think, the outline for the next book. So I especially welcome your discussion and commentary on this. And I'm going to conclude by laying out uh, four grand challenges that are concerned with networked information and that appeal to what I think we need to do going forward in addressing uh, access to networked information and uh, bringing together the technology, the policy, and the people issues. So the parts of the talk are first to spend some time on where we came from, then where we are now, and where might we go from here. So as far as where we are now, or where we came from, let's talk about uh, information infrastructure and the internet and the foundations that were made by uh, the previous winners of this award. The first, of course, Tim Berners-Lee in uh, 2000. Note that this is actually the 20th anniversary year of the World Wide Web, and uh, plenty of us could wonder how we lived without it. 
I think what we gave him credit for was recognizing that what we needed was an infrastructure that was much lighter weight and that was easier to be an author and easier to be a searcher than was possible in the internet before. His real innovation was recognizing that hypertext was something that could revolutionize the way that we thought about access to information and about infrastructure. That infrastructure scaled wildly behind, uh, beyond his or anyone else's imagination. And he's continued to innovate with the semantic web and, uh, and the web science programs since then. The next award went to Vince Cerf, whom UCLA proudly claims for his uh, PhD in computer science. Uh, and he's best known probably for the TCPIP work with Bob Kahn, but then also for founding the Internet Society, for his work in founding ICANN, and his uh, recent work is with Google and with NASA and the Internet Society on building an interplanetary Internet. And they really are working on protocols to deal with things like the time lag uh, for packet switching, which doesn't work very well when you're going from here to Mars and back. The third award went to uh, Brewster Kale, a delightfully disruptive individual. The last time I saw Brewster, he took me by the elbow and said, let's plan something disruptive together. Okay. And uh, he's still doing that. Again, he's somebody who recognized that the internet needed archiving and access. And I think he got there early enough. He got ahead of the policy game. If he tried to do it now, it would probably be almost impossible to do. He built on an extant architecture, and he built the Internet Archive in ways that have scaled far beyond what anyone expected. And he's dealt with the contributed content moving into areas of uh, personal digital archiving now, as well as had a series of conferences in that area. Paul Ginsparg came next uh, in the, the two-year cycle. This is also known as the 20th anniversary year of archive. And again, what Paul recognized was that we could rethink access to scholarly information. We could build on a behavioral infrastructure, practice infrastructure around sharing of preprints in such a way that we could get open access publishing, we could get institutional repositories, and really scale up and speed up access. That scaled hugely. The archive now gets over 6,000 submissions per month and uh, averages something on the order of 80,000 connections per hour. There are several um, iPod or iPad and other um, applications already just for access to the archive. Dan Atkins in 2008, the most recent award winner, is another series of firsts. He was the founding dean of the School of Information at the University of Michigan. He realized that you could take a very strong but traditional program in library and information science and turn it into something much broader. He came out of, uh, he came out of engineering. He had been doing kind of big iron, said, I'm tired of just building faster cycles. Let's do something much broader. He was also the founding head of the Office of Cyber Infrastructure. He chaired the Blue Ribbon Panel, which really coined that term, uh, cyber infrastructure. So he saw those opportunities, and he also saw, saw the opportunities around expanding the internet technology to a much broader base to support scholarship. And as uh, Clifford mentioned, he then recognized the need to expand that yet further to think about uh, cyber learning. And it was really, it was Dan and Cora Merritt who organized that task force on which Clifford and I both served. So with that, you've now got the librarian's daughter from Detroit. Uh, that's Betty Borgman, longtime uh, reference librarian at Wayne State University, and me sitting on the shelf. So I had certainly genetic disposition to managing information uh, coming into this field, honestly. Uh, but I'm going to give you a, f a few minutes of how I got here, which I, I hope may be instructive as, as we think forward about uh, educating our next gener generation of information professionals also. I got a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Michigan State University. And uh, the main careers open to women with bachelor's degrees in math were teaching high school or becoming programmers, neither of which was particularly attractive to me. And I tried uh, student teaching and said, I don't think that's it. 
Um, so I did a non-obvious thing encouraged by my mother, which was to go to library school. And we really did call it library school back then. Uh, but they didn't know what to do with me either. And lacking a scholarship, I taught uh, algebra and trig in this wonderful building, the Cathedral of Learning. And uh, then was also kind of paying the rent by tutoring Vietnam vets in calculus. And uh, that's when Alan Kent, the head of the program, uh, from whom I had first learned information retrieval from this book, Information Analysis and Retrieval, starting in uh, the earlier editions were 1962 and 66, uh, recognized that he had this kind of math major floating around and nobody was taking advantage of me. Uh, so he hired me to work on some of his big National Science Foundation projects. He already had a NASA Regional Dissemination Center. I worked on Pirates, the Pittsburgh Information Retrieval System. I did user training and interface design on that. And I also staffed the first implementation of the New York Times Information Bank outside of uh, the New York City offices. And he was building up a very interesting bunch of people around him, but before he hired me, he hired this fellow, Paul Evan Peters. And uh, Paul was on the same set of projects I was on, worked in another part of the team, another building, and regrettably, I didn't have the opportunity to get to know him as well as, as I wish I had. Uh, but we come from that same training, that same background, and we went similar directions. He went to Columbia University in library animation, and I went to Dallas, to the Dallas Public Library. And the reason I went there was Lillian Bradshaw, the head of the public library, had managed to make the library the largest priority of city computing over police and fire. We wrote an online catalog in assembler language, which we brought online in 1978. And Lillian Bradshaw made sure that that catalog was on the desk of every city employee who had a computer terminal that had to be the most networked online catalog of the 1970s. So we definitely got a chance to be, uh, to be first. But I was already seeing and trying to implement those online catalogs that the technology was not the hard part. The hard part was much more the people, the management, the institutions, and the policy, which is why I went to Stanford for the PhD in communication. Uh, to work with Bill Paisley and Everett Rogers, very well-known um, socio-technical researchers, and uh, Ev, Ev Rogers for the diffusion of innovations, and Bill Paisley for Spires, the Stanford Physics Information Retrieval System. I wrote a dissertation, again on online catalogs, the user's mental model of an information retrieval system. And among the reasons for that is that OCLC had picked me up and funded most of my PhD uh, by working as a research assistant on what was then this very large early 1980s uh, Counts on Library Resources, it was CLR at the time, uh, funded that went to there to Research Libraries Group, to OCLC, to the Library of Congress, to Joe Matthews, and to the Division of Library Animation of the University of California which is when I first started working with this fellow. So we go back a long way in thinking about networked information and as, uh, as he said, as he was bringing up Melville and we were trying to bring up other systems. Okay. I've been at UCLA since 1983, having been recruited by Bob Hayes, from whom I also learned library animation, that handbook on data processing for libraries educated a several generations of people doing those early days of library animation. Uh, but with detours to work in other countries and in other places, first to teach at uh, Loughborough University in uh, Britain, where the British Library funded a speaking tour around the country, really got to know my colleagues there. Just after the political changes, I was the f in the first wave of Fulbrighters to go into uh, Hungary, and actually among the first to go into Central and Eastern Europe. I was in uh, Budapest and spent uh, large amounts of time in the 1990s working with the Soros Foundation. And that's where I really began to in understand infrastructure and information and the internet and how they came together in that very turbulent uh, time of political and social change. The Gutenberg to Global Information Infrastructure book really came out of what I learned of comparatively at that time. 
And Oxford, where I spent the last sabbatical, is where I wrote the first draft of the scholarship in the digital age. And again, the chance to work with that very rich multidisciplinary community and have access to the Bodleian Library as well as to the University of California uh, resources was quite the uh, heavenly place to be for a scholar. So where are we now? Uh, I'm going to take us through a tour of what I think are four trends that I've seen in that time from the 70s through today and use those to set up where I think we know, where, where, where we think we need to go from here. So first let's talk about infrastructure per se. Cyber infrastructure is what is the term best known to this community of, of networked information. Dan Atkins and Tony Hay, uh, down there in the bottom right, uh, Tony was pretty much Dan's counterpart as head of the uh, e-science program in Britain. Together they saw that you could build on infrastructure of technology, people, and policy to develop a new kind of scholarship. There's much more information, data intensive, distributed, collaborative, and uh, multidisciplinary. Okay. So that's popularized the term, and that's kind of where we are now in thinking about networked information and scholarship. But it's worth spending a, a couple of minutes on what we mean by infrastructure. Because infrastructure is what we are building. And sometimes it's visible, and sometimes it's not very visible. Okay. It's not a new term. It's not a new idea. But it was a paper in 1996 by Lee Starr and Karen Ruliter coming out of the Digital Libraries Initiative, which many of us were working in at the time, that came up with these eight dimensions of infrastructure. And those dimensions, which were then uh, mapped into this very nice uh, two-dimensional uh, slide by Florence Millerand, part of a very important NSF report. These slides will be available. Don't try to get the small type out of here. Uh, right now, you can get them later. Uh, is a way of looking at the set of arrangements between them. So let's look at the technical to the social first. On the technical side, infrastructure is something that builds on an installed base. Uh, MARC records are a fairly obvious one. For this community, we now have, who knows, hundreds of millions at least of MARC records around the world. And that's part of what made it so easy to then build integrated library systems that you could pour those things into. But it also constrains the base. It's very hard to leave those behind and go off to something completely new. Infrastructure is the embodiment of standards. You need interoperability for infrastructures, whether it's railroads, telephones, libraries, internet, to work. On the social end of the spectrum, off on the right, infrastructure is something that you learn in your education, in your workplace, you learn how the University of California works, you, work, you learn how your particular institution works, the th kinds of things we teach people to become information professionals. At the bottom, uh, the notions here of being both embedded and uh, visible upon breakdown. You don't realize quite how dependent you are, whether it's the online catalog of the local area network until suddenly it ceases to function. It's very tightly coupled with other things. At the top, the reach or scope may be global, and transparency in Star and Ruliter's terms is pretty much the opposite of being invisible. The Japanese are learning, uh, for example, how deeply in interconnected their power systems and their transportation systems are at this time. So hold that in mind of, of what we mean by, by infrastructure. So I'll, I'll come back to that throughout the rest of the talk. These are the four trends that I want to, to take us through. A transition from more closed to a more open world, a more static kind of information and context to a more dynamic one, from a focus on readers to a focus on authors, and the transition from publications to data. And it's, it's where we are from these trends that uh, leads us to the challenges. So first, this transition from, uh, from closed to open. In the 1970s, we had an internet, actually the, in those early days of retrieval systems, 
it was not at all available to anyone beyond sort of the, the core research and military network. The, the early days of dialogue, we were using dial-up and we were using uh, proprietary networks. So they, it was the research community, most of the services we were concerned with were bibliographic, and even the network itself was closed. I'm gonna see if I can date this audience. How many people remember what NREN was? Ooh, a lot of you came along with me too. Uh, the National Research and Education Network, it was only open to um, universities and educational institutions. So we, we built up this base of standards, these cataloging rules, the MARC formats, the things that let us build these integrated commercial library automation systems. Uh, but it was pretty much an inward looking set of, set of stakeholders. From the 90s on, it was about, you know, that actually Al Gore's speech on the information superhighway was at uh, UCLA in Royce Hall one week to the day before the big 1994 earthquake. And that was the time that they changed the policy, they allowed others besides universities and research and military to interconnect with the network. And things have been very different in the time since. Uh, networked information was no longer the fairly exclusive commodity around uh, universities and research. The telecommunications moved toward this more commodity internet. And the kinds of standards that we were concerned about became internet protocols, operating systems, and the World Wide Web Consortium. So libraries, universities, educause kinds of communities became a smaller part of the overall uh, enterprise and libraries have then had to expose their content to search engines to to be discoverable. Where are we now? Now we're in a, this very funny interim stage. This is kind of mixed, open, and closed. We've still got largely open in many areas, uh, but to borrow the phrase from Jonathan Zittrain, we may be moving to the end of the generative internet. Uh, his book, The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It, is, uh, is, is a highly recommended read. And his concern, and mine here too, is as we move into things like an app world, we have much more, much more gated communities where you've got, now got three platforms for applications. Um, You've got the Apple, you've got the Google Android, and uh, now Microsoft is making a big play in their joint, uh, joint agreement with Nokia. And each of those players has complete control over what can be put on that platform. It's moving away from those more innovative days when anybody could program whatever they liked to work on uh, whatever they wanted. Okay. And that's Zittrain's concern and, and mine here as well. Uh, the search engines also are optimized for commercial content. It's the install base is going to be much more outward facing in this mixed environment. Okay. So that's one set of, tr that's one trend. The second trend is this shift from a static world to a more dynamic world of thinking about information. In uh, those days when Clifford and I were really you know, kind of getting our, our feet wet here, when things got published, they stayed published. Okay. <laughs> Libraries really could, you know, mark it and park it. It just, it doesn't work that way anymore. And think also about the difference in context. The time that we spent, back when we required an entire academic term of a master of library science degree learning to use Dialog and Orbit and BRS, we trained people to, to learn very closely how to do those Boolean searches, how to read those blue sheets, how to understand exactly how searches were executed. So that if three different people executed that search at the same time from three different places, not only would they get the same result, they would know how and why they got that result and what they could trust. That's the big shift now, is when, when you look at today's world, what happens is when you do that search, the search engines first look at who you are and where you are. Okay. The same search gets different results for different people, but the same person on a different device is going to get a different search. 
because it's looking at things like geolocation, it's looking at accumulated previous searches. Um, this is not the same kind of world that uh, certainly we grew up for information retrieval. You've got many versions of documents. You look at things like archive, and you see this whole chain of different things that have gotten published as the websites continue, um, continue to shift. So this raises questions of trust and, and of reproducibility. This, this new world of, of dynamic information is not one that was built upon the assumptions of, of scholarship. This is not one that was built around an idea of, of standing on the shoulders of giants and of, of accumulated kinds of approaches to, to information. So it's, it's this very mixed um, kind of environment that we have. And so the continuity is, is, a, is very different. Information retrieval is no longer about just sending out a query and bringing back some set of relevant objects like we or originally thought about information retrieval. It's much more like a snapshot in time. What you get right now is what you get where you are and uh, with a number of other factors that you may not be able to know. It's capturing, it's capturing a flow of information. Now, following links and relationships and, and treating objects as interdependent in many re ways reflects the flow of scholarship better than the old model of retrieval did. Uh, but it's a very different way of thinking about cataloging and thinking about metadata than the library structures we have built in. Okay. Thirdly, the scholarly journal. Is there anyone who does not recognize that image on the left side? Or who will admit to it anyway? Okay. That's the cover of the first English language uh, journal in 1665, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. And that's the same journal on the right, continuously published for 350 years. Notice that you've got the title, you've got the volume, you've got the year, you've got the statement of responsibility, you've got the place. The journals have actually not changed all of that, all that much in that, that period of time. But the way that we think about how they're being used is, is changing in some interesting ways. This, this shift from readers to authors is one that uh, first came to my attention by uh, Kimberly Douglas, the university librarian at Caltech, uh, who started as a reader services librarian and said, you know, we're spending a whole lot more time nowadays doing, uh, doing author services. So you think of that, you know, that wonderful library at Ephesus, and it's much, you know, our history has been collecting information at the time that, um, that other people were, were done with it and then making it available to others to use. There was also a much cleaner line between the, what libraries did and, and what authors did. The author, the, so what the publishers did, the, you know, when you're ready to publish something, you took it to an editor who would then work with you and, and do these various things and serve, serve a glo global clientele. Nowadays, we've got much more of, of a do-it-yourself kind of world. Any of us who have published in conference proceedings in recent years know we need to work with these really painful templates. We have to produce absolute camera-ready copy. Now, we did earlier on use those horrible blue line papers where you had to type in those, you know, certain number of centimeter inches. Uh, so that's, some of that is old and some of it's new. Uh, but authors also have to spend a lot more time doing things like negotiating copyright, posting the supplemental materials, depositing things, and, and they're being expected to maintain their own access to data under some of these new and changing rules. So the outcome is that the, rule, the, the activities have been rebalanced in, in a number of ways, and the relationships are changing, the roles of information professionals are changing. <laughs> Some would argue also that we're moving to a stage of, of universal authorship where people who are writing on Facebook, they're writing email, they're actually writing narrative and writing text on a day-to-day -day basis. That, that part of it may be good, but there's other parts of it that are maybe a bit more questionable. 
Fourth is, is this, is this data deluge? And that's where most of my research has been in the last decade. This, this deluge is coming down all of us and, and we're drowning in, not only in data, but we may just be, you know, be drowning information in many ways. The, much of that data is runoff. It's not curated, maybe it shouldn't be kept at all. We need to identify what's worth keeping, how to keep it, and the tools and services uh, to make it useful. So how has that shift changed over time? Again, we've got about 350 years here, and it was kind of that end of the project when the libraries and the archives showed up and said, okay, we're ready, you know, you're, you're done, project's over, now, now we'll take those publications. And we get the social structure, again, long negotiated peer review citation. Data, of course, evidence has been around for a very long time, but, and we always, it was always heterogeneous, but it, we th saw it as much more as, as process, as interim products, and it was very much embedded in practice, and it was something that sociologists of science might be concerned about, the, the scientists were concerned, but it was outside of our world. Now it is very much within the world, but the nature of the publications is changing quite a bit as well. In this, this very data-intensive, information-intensive environment, and speaking to multiple disciplines, we don't just write one journal article at the end of a multi-year project. We, we have these various snapshots in time. We have the multiple pieces that come out, and they need to be connected in some way. I mean, that's, again, something Archive is particularly good at, is showing how we get from one to the next. This was version one, this was version two, this was version three. But a lot of places, that, that's not the case. Uh, we disseminate them in different ways, and the data are, are now process and product, where now the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, Institute for Museum and Library Services, many other funding agencies are expecting the investigators to keep the data, to manage it, to make it uh, useful going forward. And we're also getting it disseminated in a lot of different ways that we can't quite make sense of. So where we are now is this social structure around publications is still fairly stable, and we're trying to emulate it in some ways for data, but we just don't have that history yet. And it's, it's not matching behavior, it's not matching incentives very well, which is something I'll, I'll talk, uh, come back to at the end. Uh, there's another, there's a workshop coming up this summer on dealing with issues of how you give credit and is the question whether people don't cite data well enough or is it the data not in a form that's easy to cite? Who should be in charge of metadata? Authors, libraries, repositories. Um, I have several dissertations going on uh, amongst my students who are uh, dealing with a number of these things. So, but it's not all clear yet who's going to take responsibility for what content, for what periods of time, much less who's going to pay for this kind of stewardship. Okay, where might we go from here? This is where I want to spend the last part of the talk and uh, pose some large, some large challenges to you going forward. Okay. This uh, background slide is from Vince Cerf's uh, Interplanetary Internet Project, and the bottom right is from our portion of the Data Conservancy, where we are billing ourselves as the curators to the stars. Uh, which is to tell you that the sky is actually not the limit of where we could go from here. Certainly, if you listen to Vince Cerf, it's not the limit. Okay. Uh, but I think the next st stages from here are very hard, which is why I put them out as, as uh, challenges, and they're ones to this community and, and all stakeholders in networked information so that we can be thinking about where we want to be going forward. What do you want information infrastructure and the internet to be 10, 20, 30 years hence from now? So here's my four grand challenges, which I will take us through. One is boldly to take back information retrieval. Second is to engage the entire information life cycle. Third is to distribute the architecture. And lastly is to match policy to incentives. And I will, I will work us through each of these. And I think there's people in this room 
uh, who are in a position to, to think deeply about these things and, and to invest considerable research time in them. First, information retrieval. Libraries and schools of information have largely relinquished uh, control of information retrieval, both to computer science departments and to commercial development in the last decade or two. Um, search engines are optimized for unstructured data and for the commercial market. They are set to take that really clean, simple little box that you can put two or three words in. And what they do, they do very well. But they don't do everything, and, and they don't do enough. In many respects, they're, they're a step backwards from where we were starting to get to of tailoring retrieval to the different kinds of information, the, the different kinds of data, the different kinds of structure. What you've got in astronomy is very different from what you've got in archaeology, much less what you've got in, in art history. These are some of the things that we need going forward th that I have listed here under tomorrow. First of all, on discoverability. We need the generic search. The search engines are important to us, but we need to use them to discover some of those more specialized search engines. Uh, who's going to invest in those, those specialized engines, whether it's for astronomy, archaeology, art history, or, or take your pick of fields, is again one of the questions that we need to think about. Second, on organization and retrieval. We need to rethink those and go back to some of the fundamental concepts of the 1970s. Questions of aboutness, which were central and are still theoretically central to subject access, are ones that we've not revisited in, in much too long. Search engines try to deal with aboutness in a little bit in a semantic way in terms of matching different words together, but they, they tend to do it within the four corners of the document. What they've done is they've let go of most of the cataloging, the kinds of description that is outside those four corners of the document, that sets the context for them. They've tried to do it without that. What they have done well is linking related objects, at least in a syntactic way. That's where the hypertext and the citation work so well but they've not done it very well in a semantic way of tying together related objects. And again, scholarship and writing and authorship work in, in sequential ways. There, there's meaning that we can pull together. And this is where we need things like object reuse and exchange and the open archives um, a protocol for metadata harvesting as well is we need to be able to assert these kinds of relationships so we can enrich in those links and do, so aboutness is one way to get there, but linking in a much more semantic way is something that much more research is needed and has been let go by the wayside. And then thirdly, these questions of reproducibility are essential that we go back and think about, is we've moved into a search engine world that has gone away from sense of trust and sense of reproducibility of, of science and of scholarship and that's a very, it's a very different kind of retrieval that I hope that we can rethink. Second is to engage the larger life cycle. As I mentioned several times, librarians and archivists have generally waited until other people were done with something, until it was published, until the scientist was done with the data, until the records had gone to the end stage out of the government agency before they take them over. But the market and park it doesn't work in this environment. Information professionals need to be engaged throughout the entire process and to partner much more closely with domain experts. Okay. If we're going to manage data, we need to understand those contexts around them. Um, my graduate students, several of, several of whom have, are here, really are out working in the field with people. I have wonderful stories of people falling into quicksand, following um, water quality projects around, um, another one getting um, altitude sickness in Peru, laying a seismic network, and so on. They really understand wh what these data are and where they come from. We need to have more of that kind of engagement 
in our education and in the way that we partner with professionals. We need domain experts, we need to partner with research teams, and we need to stop separating data from practice if there's any hope of really getting reuse or reproducibility, much less achieving that, um, that standard from the open archives or open archival information system, the OIS standards, which says independently understandable is a basic requirement. Okay. That's a very, very high bar to achieve, and it's not one that you can possibly achieve if you only show up with a bag at the end of the day. Thirdly, is to distribute the architecture. Data is scaling much faster than is storage capacity or are the pipes of the internet, and that will happen for the for the foreseeable future. We have, um, as of the February 11th issue of Science on data, uh, we now have more data than we have storage capacity. So if there ever was a time when saving it all was an option, that's gone. Uh, but the, what that also means, though, is that old information retrieval notion of surrogates is back. Because you can move surrogates around the network in ways that you can't move big amounts of pipes around the network. And that's also, you know, things like object reuse and exchange are built on taking, you know, returning to this notion of surrogates for discovery. Metadata are really important, and there's quite a bit that we can do with them. Similarly, uh, we don't have the capacity of the pipes. The astronomers that we're working with, when they want to move terabytes of data from the East Coast to the West Coast of the United States, they put terabyte disks in 100-pound boxes and they send them by FedEx. That is the fastest way to move large amounts of data from the East Coast to the West Coast. And because of that, they're not trying to move large amounts of data to where their computation is. They're trying to move computation to the data. Now, libraries are barely beginning to, to deal with the notion of taking data at the end of a project. They're not really in a position of becoming major computing centers to process those data, okay. which means we need to bring together the data and the assets and the stewardship in some, some new ways. We need to think through the economic conditions to share the access and the assets. We've got a huge duplication of effort. And at the same time, we've got a number of economic issues of incentives and sharing. Everyone wants access to these data. But it's the tragedy, the commons problem. You know, if the data are the grazing land in the middle of the town, who is it who's going to pay for getting enough grazing land to accommodate everyone's sheep or everyone's computation or everyone's reuse of these data? And it's, it's kind of a classic economic problem. And I think we, we don't have enough economists in the room. We certainly don't have enough economics training in most of our information professionals programs. But I think that's another thing we need to think about, the economics, the technology, the policy, and the behavior of how we're going to design an architecture that is going to bring these together. The, uh, the fourth and the final of the challenges that I offer to you is the need to match the policy to the incentives. And uh, this was the topic of uh, the talk that I gave last September in Beijing for the joint uh, North American libraries and, and uh, China National Libraries to think about sharing digital resources, is we have not dealt well with matching the policy to the incentives. We're, we're really pushing for getting people to save their data, to manage their data, without a clear understanding of why they should do that. It's the, the reuse and the reproducibility appear to be the most important reasons. And if that, that indeed is the case, then those should be what, what would drive the policy to think about, what, think about what's worth keeping. Our mission in the Data Conservancy, the Big Data Net project that I'm part of and that Saeed Chowdhury, who's here, is the uh, PI for, our mission is 
to treat data curation as a means to advance scientific progress rather than viewing it as an end in itself. And that requires a, a very different kind of engagement with the community and we've, we've divided up responsibilities for observational data in, in a number of ways. UCLA is dealing with the uh, just the astronomy, and uh, Mary Marlino here is dealing with some of our earth sciences. The Illinois group are dealing with some of the biosciences, and uh, Marine Biological Labs at Woods Hole is dealing with yet some more of different kinds of data. But it's, it certainly colors the way that you would make these policy decisions. In working with different kinds of scientists in different communities over the last decade, it's very clear they don't want to manage their data, they want to use their data. It's expensive, it's not well rewarded, it's highly inconsistent uh, to manage those. And unless we, we, we align those a bit better than we have, we're going to get data management plans that meet the spirit of, or meet the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. The selection matters and the stewardship matters. What matters most to our astronomers, for example, is access to big stores of astronomy data where you have astronomers nearby who understand where those data came from, what the contextual issues, what the instrument readings were, what the con local conditions were on those nights in those skies so that they can make sense of them. So this is another area where we should be concerned about the tragedy of the commons if we're not going to bring these to data together and invest in them in some very useful ways. So that is the, uh, the summary of the four and what I'm, I want to leave you with is we need to think collectively about how to take back information retrieval. The search engines are a necessary but no means a sufficient condition for the future of access to networked information, certainly not for scholarship. We need to engage the entire information life cycle if we're going to understand what those information, what those data are, and to make them useful to anyone in the future. We need to think collectively about the architecture. We cannot save everything. We cannot store everything. We can't even move it from place to place. So where are we going to make the investments, who's going to make them, and how are we going to share them? And then lastly, we all need to be thinking about policy and incentives and what the interests are of the people who produce and hold those data and those publications are. So this is a research agenda, it's a policy and action agenda, but it's also an agenda for education. It's the kinds of issues that need to be in our master's programs, in our doctoral programs, and increasingly in the undergraduate programs of the information field, ones that will produce another kind of new educated adult who may not necessarily find a career in the information world per se, but one who will find these a very useful set of skills. And I think if, if we can address these going forward, we will have built upon the vision of Paul Evan Peters and on the uh, foundation and the infrastructure of the previous winners of the award that honors him. So it's up to all of us to take it forward and uh, may we be good ancestors. Okay. With thanks to my many co-authors, uh, there were so many, I just turned it into a wordle. Okay. Uh, one does not do this kind of research alone, and uh, the list of current students is, uh, is, is quite long as well, and I hope that uh, I can offer you some very, uh, interesting, smart, productive, and well-educated masters and doctoral graduates in the years going forward. Thank you. Thank you. I've left some time for questions. There's microphones in the middle of the room. Ah, here we go. And please identify yourselves. Uh, I'm David Rosenthal from the LOCKS program at Stanford. And uh, I guess I want to be a little bit of a devil's advocate here. Um, you're arguing for the inadequacy of the generic uh, um, means of access to information. And 
I agree that they're unsatisfactory to scholars in many ways, but um, they're hard to compete with because they have a business model that works and everything else doesn't. And the, the amounts that we can spend on providing specialized information access tools are insignificant in the R&D budgets of Google and so on. So that even relatively ineffective, even relatively specialized areas, they can actually afford to invest more than we can. And they can afford to employ better programmers than we can to spend that R&D on. So they're just extraordinarily difficult to, com to compete with. And it seems that um, without some equivalently effective business model, this is all very nice, but doomed to failure. Thank you, David. And you, you certainly have argued on the economic, is economic fronts here uh, very articulately as well. I mean, and that's why I said it was necessary. The, the search engines are necessary, but not sufficient. The, I mean, we're not going to have a large industry, and the fact that there's not a large industry to produce fabulous engines for astronomy or archaeology, I think, is, is a fact of life. So how is it that we get coordinated action? Do we take on better open source projects? Do we change the way that we look at uh, research funding? Do we build in more tools and services over and above, uh, over and above curation? I mean, the fact that uh, a place like UCLA for as, as, as much we seem to be suffering in the budget cuts can still support uh, 75 email systems, and we have managed to cut 26 course management systems down to 12 uh, by going to, I think, well, down to 12 or 15 by going with Moodle, still says there, there's a lot of room that we could bring things together and decide where the priorities are um, across the community. And I, and I think we're, we're seeing that, and, and we're seeing that in research, and we sit down and talk to some of these groups and ask them which information problems are solved and which ones are not solved and which they think are the big problems going forward. I think if we come out of DataNet being able to identify where the high value is, if we can come out and say, if we invest here, here, and here, we will get some big innovative payoffs. Those are the kinds of things we need to make some decisions about going forward. So I think I'm more optimistic than you are, but I think we need to work together. Thank you. Um, your slide of the co-authors and funders made me think um, whether you could comment on um, the emerging skill sets or otherwise that are going to get us to where you've been talking about. Uh, the emerging skill sets... Of, of people. Of, of, of information professionals yeah. and, and graduates. Uh, I think they need a set of... I mean, they certainly need more information retrieval than I think they're getting in most programs right now. They need to understand information organization. Uh, in fact, uh, Bob Glushko at Berkeley and I are working with our students from both Berkeley and UCLA at um, a new foundational textbook on information organization retrieval that is trying to bring together perspectives from libraries, archives, business, and computing. Because we, you know, we need to put people in many different kinds of institutions. So I think we need people who understand organization retrieval from more than just, say, a bibliographic perspective. That would be a set of skills. They need to understand more policy, more information policy. They need more economics. And they certainly need more technical skills than, than, mo than most of them are, are getting right now. I would like to see more people who have domain expertise, whether it's a strong bachelor's degree or another graduate degree in, in an area. If we're going to have these kinds of partnerships with other groups, we need to, to leverage those. So whether it's specialties in bioinformatics, specialties in law, we, uh, we get a large number of people who are, say, you know, dropped out of being 
JDs and, and partners of places and want to come into the field, we certainly welcome them. That intellectual property negotiation is another great set of skills that we teach. And we've added courses, we, in fact, we've added a course in intellectual property uh, to the curriculum with a, a very fine adjunct we have. Clem Guthrow, uh, Colby College in Maine. I was uh, intrigued and perhaps a bit unsettled by your comments on the fact that data was scaling faster than we could save it. Um, do you see that getting any better or is it only going to get worse? Uh, you know, especially in light of the NSF mandates that we um, have to in some way save this data and manage it, um, it seemed like we're sort of at odds in our ability to do that. Um, I want to make sure I understand your question. So, the cons so uh, you're concerned about the, the the scaling or how we're going to manage it at scale? Both. Both. Okay. <laughs> the scaling is a reality. Okay. And and scale is something that's not going to go away, and it's going to be a, a continuous chase of the the bigger the the bigger the disks we have. The faster the pipes we have, the fatter the pipes. We're, it's, it's like the, the 405 freeway between here and LA. The more, the more lanes you add, the more traffic it's going to attract. Okay? That's not going to change. But we also need to make a distinction between data management and data storage. NSF has asked for data management plans, not data storage plans, and not data curation plans. Throwing it away is a management strategy. And I think the, the, equate, the, the tendency to equate data management with data curation and data storage is a concern. And it's one where we need to bring back those, that expertise in, in selection and, and appraisal, uh, which are you know, the appraise, archivists appraise a, a body of things to say, which ones do I want to keep? Librarians tend to select things out of this world of, say, what's published. I want this one, this one, and this one. In the data environment, it's a snapshot in time that there's no real equivalent. And it's not just deciding what data to keep, it's what goes with it. We're seeing, for example, that what the, the scientist considers to be data might just be those numbers in the spreadsheet. But those numbers are meaningless unless you've got a record of the deployment, of the instrument, of the settings of the dilution level, of the pH level, all kinds of other things that sort of everybody knows. That's a kind of tacit background knowledge that doesn't get written down. So this, this part of what's the data to one person is different than the data to the other, uh, could, some of which could be reused and, and some not. So it's, it's understanding that whole collection and deciding which of that is worth keeping and not and working with the community and deciding what can be thrown away because some of it is just going to have to get thrown away. Hi, I'm William Gunn. I'm here with uh, Mendeley Research and uh, I'm not a librarian of any sort. I'm actually a researcher. I've generated tons of, of purely curated data in my time so I hope this, my perspective will be a little bit um, interesting. Um, there, the talk was really a fascinating long-term overview, and I had two particular moments where I thought, you know, oh yeah, this is great, she really does get it. And then I had another moment where I was like, oh wait, maybe she doesn't. And <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear that one. And okay. so the, the point that I was really happy to see was when you guys, when you started talking about data and data curation and what we're going to do with all this data. Um, in um, the... Uh, the data science community uh, with the Hadoop tools, they talk about moving computation to the data all right. of the time. Um, the, the part that was a little um, uh, unsettling was, was voiced by a gentleman earlier, so the taking back and, you know, let's be the experts in search again. Um, I mean, certainly a lot of the, the um, learning and the tools and stuff that the search experts are using now um, have been created by these other folks earlier, you know, people who are information professionals to start with. So there's an angle for that, but it definitely seems like with all of this poorly structurally, poorly curated data out there that that's really um, the, the big need that, that um, only someone who has experience with managing large amounts of information in different kinds can actually address. So I don't know if there's a question in there somewhere. Yeah, but I just okay. I <laughs> 
what I, what I think I'm hearing is, as the kernel of that is, I mean, what you're saying is people who you need experience managing large amounts of data, and you need to understand the domain not the domain of the data. Right. I, I completely agree, and, and maybe I didn't say that explicitly enough. It's uh, it, it's it's been very striking in the areas that we're working with, and I, I serve on CoData, and, and I'm on the National Academy's board on research data and information, which uh, deals with these things quite intently as well. Is that you need you need to know a lot about astronomy to manage astronomy data. It's very hard for somebody with an art history degree to manage astronomy data, and vice versa. There's a huge amount of domain knowledge. There's a lot of hand waving. There's huge amounts of tacit knowledge that don't get written down. And if you're going to get anywhere near independently understandable later, you need to understand the domain well enough to be able to determine what's worth writing down and is going to be needed to add that context around it, which is why I'm arguing for thinking through that whole life cycle. And it's why we're certainly seeing the stewardship needs those people next to it. I mean, the, the way the filtering is done in different ways in different fields, and in high energy physics, as I'm sure you know, is you, you put up a filter in that stream. And if it, the, the filter says, this is what I'm looking for, and if, if, if it's not what you're looking for, it falls on the floor. You never really staved it in the first place. I mean, that's certainly how CERN functions. And then we've talked to people like at SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. They've, they've got data with bit rot because they don't want to do that filtering because they don't know what they're looking for. So you've got very different requirements in these different fields, and it's understanding those requirements and working in a, in a domain way. So I, I think we're saying the same thing, but... Um, I could do several hours worth of talks. In fact, I teach two graduate courses just on data, data practices, and data curation. And there's several universities that are moving in this direction, and that's something else that needs to be in the curriculum. So, um, Dean, and then I think we should wrap up pretty soon. Yeah, Dean Kraft, Cornell University. I'm just wondering if you could comment on the difference in between the challenges of big data and lots of pieces of little data. Ooh, th oh, that's a, ni that's a nice one, Dean. Um, and this is uh, actually uh, Clifford has o opined on, on this at, at some point. What well. University of California loves the word opine. Um, <laughs> is that the challenges of data have less to do with size than with complexity? So physics data, which is you know really big numbers, huge huge piles of stuff may actually be a fairly small number of variables and fairly cleanly measured and, and fairly well understood where you get into the biological sciences and the question of what to measure is still so much challenged that a, 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 Trying to take care of a small amount of biological data, environmental field data, where it's about a number of different kinds of organisms, could require much more human labor and much more expertise than many times that in terms of disk storage of data in some of the physical sciences. Okay. So it's, it's not, it's, um, size matters except when it doesn't. How's that? Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Well, that was quite a wonderful speech. It took us over quite a span of years and left us with a number of futures to think about. Um, please join me in uh, thanking Chris Borgman. <laughs>